I've been with CoreOS for about six months now, and um, I'm going to briefly talk to you about the introduction to Tectonic. This is more of an all overview to our product. Um, we did a big release yesterday. So I'm going to take you through the installation process, show you around the console, talk to you about what the dashboard looks like. And um, while I have the spotlight, that's my Twitter handle. It's Ritu underscore John. So please go ahead and follow me. Okay. So let's get started. Um, this is what you can expect out of today's talk. I'm going to briefly touch over what Tectonic is. Um, a quick show of hands. How many of you have used Kubernetes before? Oh, that's awesome. How many of you have used Tectonic before? OK. So OK, I know how to like gauge my audience, and I'll go in depth accordingly. And then we'll talk about what actually goes into Tectonic and the key components and what makes Tectonic Tectonic. So what is Tectonic? This was literally me on my first day at CoreOS. So if you guys get a little lost through this talk, please stop me. We can go over questions. I can clarify anything you want and uh, don't hesitate. So a very, very brief description. Uh, what Tectonic is, is our enterprise solution to Kubernetes, which is secure, simple, and self-driving. So let's go over this point by point. Tectonic will ensure that your cluster is always up to date with the most recent security patches, and it will make sure that your overall usability is secure. So basically, it makes it secure. It will go ahead and make sure that you can install it and get started as simple as possible. So your installation's easy. Um, you literally have to click a few buttons to get through it. And then you have your Kubernetes cluster up and running. Finally, what is self-driving? When a software basically knows how to keep itself up to date, we, we call this whole concept self-driving. What it entails is that it's also self-hosted. What we do is we use Kubernetes to manage Kubernetes. So you have Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes. And all, this entire system is self-healing and self-recoverable. So you, as a DevOps engineer, as an entire ops team, you don't need to drop everything that you're doing and go try to get the latest version of Kubernetes. Kubernetes will take care of that. So you can imagine the amount of engineering effort that can actually be saved just by running this. And basically, you won't be woken up late in the night just to go fix a cluster that's gone down, because there you go, Kubernetes will recover itself. So basically, you don't have to worry about it being highly available at all. Kubernetes is actually going to do that for you. And we all know how important it is to keep up to date and current with the latest version, because you get all your security patches, you get access to the most current functionality, and so on. Other than these three points, uh, a few things I would like to quickly touch upon. It's reliable scalability, uh, scalability, because what happens is when you have your entire deployment as one single file, you can basically just clone that and say, hey, I want to run another one and it's up and running for you. It's basically just a few click of buttons. It's also portable and hybrid, because as, as I said, your entire deployment is one file. You can move this file around and basically deploy it anywhere you like. And uh, finally, it's consistent, again, because it's all in a file. You move it around. Only the contents of the fi file get deployed. You can run it across any infrastructure that you want. Let's move on. Um, now let's take a step back and quickly do a very quick overview of Kubernetes, just because that is the heart of Tectonic. So Kubernetes is nothing but an orchestration platform for running apps, apps or jobs in containers. Clearly all of y'all know that because you all have played with Kubernetes. And to dive a little bit into its architecture, it's nothing but master nodes and worker nodes. You have your master nodes that are basically telling your worker nodes what to do. The entire brain power of how your orchestration happens is within the master nodes, which we call the control plane. And your worker nodes do nothing but sit there, wait for workloads to come to it, and basically run what you tell it to run. This next diagram I have gives a, a mental visual of it. 
You have all these servers lying around. All you have to do is pick a few as master nodes, keep them aside, and say, this is going to be where my brain power is. This is my control plane. And it's going to tell all the other servers what to do. And that goes from like um, seeing if it's recovered, seeing it, if it's gone, undergone any failures, recovering from those failures, all of that, all the operational logic, basically. Next, a quick overview of what the Kubernetes control plane looks like. It looks like any other web app that you have ever seen in your life. You have the kubectl, which is how the client actually interacts with what's behind those walls. Then you have etcd, which is the data store, which is the database that you need for persistent storage. And mind you, etcd is the primary data store of Kubernetes, which was actually written here in 2013 at CoreOS. So the cool thing about etcd is that it's clustered and replicated, and um, that's how you make sure everything's stable, because all of your persistent state is in etcd. And finally, we have the API server. So whenever you think Kubernetes, you should think API server, because it's basically through the API server that you can do anything on Kubernetes. It basically gives you APIs, you absorb those APIs, use it however you want, and you get the functionality you desire. Then we also have the scheduler, which, as the name says, does nothing but schedule workloads on um, uh, worker nodes. It knows about the amount of resources that are actually present, so it can make intelligent decisions about where to go and deploy them. And finally, we have the controller manager, who is basically sitting around and looking if anything's going wrong, and it can recover from it safely. I'll talk a little bit more about it in the next slides, but this is our basic overview. Um, any questions? Yeah, clearly everyone's a Kubernetes expert, so I wasted my time on that one. But let's move on to what the tectonic architecture is. So at the heart of it, of course, we have 100% Kubernetes, upstream Kubernetes. We don't do a fork of it or anything. We literally take it directly from upstream. And then tectonic kind of packages it with all of these other cool little tools that we have that actually makes it do what you want it to do. So the user can get full benefit because of these cool tools that we have with Kubernetes. So I'll quickly run through them, and then we'll dive more into detail in the following slides. But just to tell you what they are, um, first we have our console, which is basically the dashboard that Tectonic has. And it's a pretty nice GUI, uh, very intuitive. The user can basically come in, see how many resources he's eating up. He can see what the deployments looks like. He can actually dynamically upload these deployments or pods from within the console. And I, I know that uh, a quick question is going to be, oh, then why not use the upstream dashboard that, that's already there? That takes us to our second point, which is basically authentication. We use something called DEX to do the authentication, which means through DEX, you can plug it into any um, authentication mechanism you want. You can use LDAP, you can use SAML, you can use Google to log in, you can use GitHub. So that's the neat thing. You don't have to worry about how you authenticate your users. Then we have operators. Again, I'm going to dive more into this later. So for now, I'm going to call them magical little things that take care of how smoothly your tectonic cluster is going to run. Um, we also have monitoring via Prometheus. You, as a user, can show up and keep track of all the resources that you're eating up. You can make informed decisions of whether you want to scale it up, whether you want to scale it down, whether if you have some incident that's reported, you can go ahead and meddle with that. And finally, we have our installer, which I will tell you, again, we've revamped that quite a bit. So I have some in interesting news about that. The installer is basically what lets you get your Kubernetes cluster up and running in just a few clicks. And we're actually going to see a demo of that at the end of my talk. So I'll show you how simple it really is. I'm not lying. And finally, we have support. So if you're not happy with any of this and you still want something more, our support team's there to like take care of that for you. OK, again, I'm going to break for questions. OK, you're fine. So now let's dive into the key components of what Tectonic is. So let's start with the installer. 
So recently, which was uh, from our release yesterday, which is 1.6.2, we announced that the Tectonic installer is now open source. And what we've done is that we've built it all on Terraform, which is awesome because now customers can go ahead and customize it as much as they want to fit their infrastructure or their environment, all with just like going ahead and modifying Terraform variables. If you're wondering what Terraform is, um, I have a slide of that, I think, next. Uh, we'll, we'll touch upon that. So if you want to go ahead and play with the installer, we have great examples and everything at the CoreOS Tectonic Installer repo. I do urge you to go check it out. It'll give you a nice way of going through the entire process with amazing docs. And lastly, we support it on AWS and bare metal. We also have some alpha support for Azure, OpenStack, and VMware, actually. But soon we're looking to support more infrastructures as well. Like I promised, so Terraform is basically, we introduce it so that we can support customizations for all sorts of customer um, environments. So you can picture Terraform as this very, very powerful config map. You go into this config map, modify the variables to what you want your environment to look like, and you can go ahead and deploy it. It's as easy as that. As that. And it also has another advantage. Let's say you want to deploy like 10 clusters, which are like duplicates of each other. You can basically write a script to just go ahead, consume Terraform, and you can, run, you can basically get 10 clusters up in no time. And again, please go and check out our installer. There's a bunch of examples, bunch of docs that makes it very easy to run through the whole thing. Okay, next we have our Tectonic console. That's what it looks like. Um, as you can see on the left, uh, very intuitive. You can go ahead into deployments, go and uh, basically edit that dynamically. We have pods. Um, anyway, I'll dive more into this when we actually do the demo. That way we can click around and see more into it. But on the right, you can see that the graphs tell you exactly how much each pod or each deployment is actually using up. So you can make an informed decision of what, what you want to do with this information. And like I said before, the, when you show up to the console, we handle authentication. And this is how we handled authentication. So DEX is what we use as our federated identity provider. I'm going to give this slide a little more love because I work on it personally, and I'm a contributor, contributor and maintainer of DEX. So what DEX is, is it, it's an open, ID, open IDC provider with LDAP and SAML plugin. So we recently added the SAML plugin. And we also um, support stuff like GitHub. We should add Facebook soon, maybe soon enough. But anything that you've heard of that is an identity provider, you can come, plug it into DEX, and DEX takes care of your authentication. So what I mean by that is as soon as you show up to your Tectonic cluster, you'll have to go ahead and fill in your username and credentials and your password. All the magic that happens on the back end of how the authentication is done is handled by DEX. So DEX is open source. Um, oh, I have it. I have the repo right there. I'm sorry, it's blue. It's basically CoreOS DEX. And uh, we support Google, SAML, and I welcome all of you to go ahead and write a connector for it, and you can support anything that you want. It's very easy. Connectors are how we actually federate our identity. And all we do is go ahead and borrow that identity from the identity provider so that we can authenticate the user. And uh, another nice thing about this is, so Dex comes by default with Tectonic, and it doesn't use an external database. And it uses the third-party resources, if you're familiar with that. That's what it uses to basically have its persistent state. And if nothing, it's a great alternative to actually using X509 certs, which is really hard to copy-paste and like manage in general. So yeah, that's DEX for you. A quick run-through of what the flow looks like. Let's say you have a client app and a user shows up to that app to authenticate himself or herself, Dex is the middleman that basically sits there. And when the user visits the app, the client app is actually going to redirect you all the way to Dex through an OAuth2 request. So what Dex does is it uses OIDC, which is just another version of 
OAuth 2. And then DEX is going to go and borrow your identity from the upstream identity provider and pass something called a code back to the client app. Next, uh, the magical things I talked about earlier, which were operators. What an operator is, is it represents the human operational knowledge in a software to reliably manage an application. So to put it very easy, if you are a DevOps engineer or you've, you've like known about one, you know how hard it is to actually have run books. What happens when a cluster goes down, a DevOps engineer is woken up at 2 a.m., he has to go look through the run book, figure out how to like solve this big mess. The operators are going to do it for you because they basically take the human knowledge that you need to maintain your cluster and you basically put it into a file. That's what operators does. It sits there, analyzes your state of what the cluster is at, and if it needs to fix anything, it's going to go ahead and do that for you. There's no need for that DevOps engineer to come in and fix everything. So we basically let software fix itself. So now let's go through the operators that Tectonic actually uses one by one. So first we have the etcd operator. So just to back up, etcd is stateful, it's clustered, and it's fully replicated. So every write is basically written out to a bunch of replicas all over at the same time. And we need to ensure that etcd is monitored, right? Because if your entire database is not available, you're in trouble, for sure. High availability is critical for etcd's functioning. So we need to make sure that it's recoverable if something goes wrong. And that's what the operator does for you. It basically carries out those three behavioral aspects. It observes to see what your current state is. It's going to analyze and compare it to your desired state. And it's going to act according to how to get your current state to your desired state. And that's just a bunch of, um, that's just an example of what your desired state could look like and what, how you can get to it. So um, I know it, I've oversimplified it, but if you think about it, the fact that you don't need to worry about how your cluster functions once it's under failure is a pretty remarkable thing. Um, again, I'm going to pause for questions. Okay. Let's move on. Next, we have um, Clo. Sorry about that syntax, but that is our container Linux update operator, which was again recently added into Tectonic. Um, you don't have to worry about which version of container Linux you are running on Tectonic because this operator is going to do it for you. It's basically the Kubernetes operator that's going to manage all of your updates to container Linux. And um, it basically does what Locksmith does, but we've taken that away because now Clio integrates much better with K Kubernetes. So next we have uh, what's called TCO and KVO, which is our tectonic channel operator and our cube version operator. Again, as the name suggests, I think I used some really bad ink there. Anyway. But all the tectonic channel operator does is it sits there, analyzes the tectonic channel, looks for updates. If it does find updates, your cluster is automatically updated to that new state. Um, same thing for the kube version operator. It looks for updates to Kubernetes and makes sure that you are at the latest version at any given time. Finally, the Prometheus operator. What this operator does is it sits there and looks for updates to Prometheus. It also handles create and destroy operations and it does monitor your config as well. And again, this is open source, so you can go find it at this link, which is CoreOS Prometheus Operator. I forgot to mention, even our etcd operator is open source, and you can find it in that link mentioned. Um, let's move on. OK, I know I've thrown a bunch of stuff at you, so if you do have any questions, please, please, you can speak now. <laughs> OK. Great. Either I'm really clear or nobody's getting anything. Either way. But let's move on. Um, there are two more compon components that I didn't mention earlier, one of which is boot queue. And this is what makes our installation process really easy. Because this is the tool that handles the self-hosted part of Kubernetes clusters. It kind of acts as a segue till your actual control plane is up. So it mimics your control plane, which is your master nodes, till your actual master nodes are up. 
Again, this is open source. We use it from that repo. And basically, it ensures that you're, you are in a good state till it can like leave you and say, OK, you have your master nodes up. It's fine for me to go away. And the last component is the ingress controller. This is basically, you, if you know about Kubernetes ingress, this is just a controller to that. If not, I'll touch upon what um, ingress is in Kubernetes terms. It's basically a collection of rules that allows inbound connections to reach the cluster services. As you can imagine, within a cluster, networking or communication might not be easy. Um, ingress is basically your routing mechanism to get to any of your services at any given time. It can also act as a load balancer. And what we use in Tectonic is the Nginx ingress controller. And um, again, a controller is nothing but it's responsible for sitting there and watching your API server's endpoint to make sure it's redirecting you to the services that you actually need to reach. Yep, that's all I have for my slides. So basically, a takeaway from this, um, Tectonic is basically for anyone who wants to save on engineering effort and go ahead and save some time updating your servers because Tectonic is going to do that for you. And you can spend more time innovating. Oh, sorry, I have a final slide. If, even though you didn't get anything from my talk, I would, like to take, I would like you to take this image away. It's basically a good description of what Tectonic is. We have Kubernetes at the heart of it. And we give you all of these tools that make the user experience much easier. We give you monitoring to make, so, make sure you can see how you're use, using your resources. We give you authentication through DEX. You can plug it in with anything on the back end, be it SAML, be it LDAP. And we give you a really nice user interface, which is super intuitive to use. And of course, we give you automatic updates to self-driving. Um, one last slide about CoreOS. It's, it, the reason why we do such a great job of delivering the latest and the greatest to our customers is because of this really nice cycle that we have here. All we do is take upstream Kubernetes. We don't fork it. We take it into Tectonic. We let the customers go ahead and deploy Tectonic in their environments. And depending on how it acts in their environments, Let's say you find a security bug. Let's say you find, like the user finds a feature request that they need for their particular environment. You can consult with our engineers, and then we work around a solution for you and take that back into Kubernetes again. So it's all promoting upstream use of open source code. And now let's move on to our demo. So before getting here, I already downloaded a tar file. Right there, I already have the latest version of Tectonic as a tarball. The first step I'm going to do is basically untar it. Almost done. OK. CD into Tectonic. Basically going to launch my installer. So this is our very first page where we go ahead and pick our platform. I'm going to pick up uh, AWS for now because uh, it might be a little faster, but I'll show you how easy this is to do. So Google already knows my access ID and secret, so I don't need to put that in. But what this is is your AWS access key ID and secret, which you need to put in so that it basically can log into your AWS account. I'm going to pick a region. Let's pick, um, let's pick this. I think the California one is running out of resources. So let's put that in Ohio. Go to the next step. Let's give this a name, demo, test. Um, you basically pick the version of the container Linux uh, update channel that you want. I'm going to pick stable to be safe. And here's where you can pick if you want the operators or not. We've still deemed this as an experimental feature, so you need to explicitly check this checkbox to make sure that you download it. And now it's going to ask me for my CoreOS license, which I'm going to copy from here. Please don't mug this up while I'm doing it. And so this is just basically your CoreOS license in the full secret. 
Um, it lets you explicitly tag an AWS tag. So let's give it a name and call it demo test. And we're going to go ahead. Um, it's going to ask you if you want to use your own CA certificate, or it'll generate one for you. Um, this is how you can basically bring your own CA certificate in a PEM format and use that. I'm just going to say generate the CA file for me. Um, this is where you put in your SSH keys. Uh, for this little step, you need to go into the AWS dashboard and make sure that your SSH key is already uploaded on there. And that's how we have all these options. So mine's our John. I'm going to go ahead and pick that. Next. This lets you, this lets you pick how many master nodes and how many worker nodes you need. Um, for now, let's keep it simple. We're just going to do one of each. But you can see how, how much you can customize it as much as you want or suit it to your environment. So for now, we'll stick with one. So again, this asks you to fill up the DNS name. It's already pre-filled for you. Select a domain. I'm going to select the Tectonic Dev Core OS one. Here is where you can either bring your existing VPC or you can create a new one. Again, by default, it lets you create a new one, but it's pretty awesome that you can use an existing one, and the advanced features let you pick even the uh, IP address uh, format, and then you can oh, where is the yeah you can even pick the Kubernetes pod range and service range. But this is all pre-filled for you. For now, I'm not going to touch this. But just to show you that we do have advanced settings where you can go and change all of these. Okay, so let, uh, Google thinks it's never mind. So let's just do our John at example. Um, this is basically the admin login that you need. Like I said, the first page is going to make you authenticate with Dex, and this is where you need to fill in that admin, and pass, uh, admin email address and password. And that's all. And then you click Submit, and you wait around for Terraform to apply. You wait for the resolution of your DNS, and then you basically start your, start your Tectonic console. So this usually doesn't take more than um, 15 minutes. You can see Terraform is going ahead and applying its state. And let's look through this. While we poke around, we'll go back to that other one, and I'll, I'll show you that it's up and running. So we can poke around the one I already have. Uh, let's. OK, that's big enough. So if you go to workloads, you can go to each deployment that you have. Basically, OK, let's go to Dex just because that's my favorite one. Um, you can go ahead and click on Tectonic Identity, and it'll show you the exact deployment that was used to create the pod. So you can even dynamically update this. So this is what the Kubernetes deployment looks like. Just to show you how we can dynamically update it, let's go to an older version of DEX just, just for fun. So now I've dynamically changed that image to DEX version 2.4.0, which is one version older. And you can save changes. And it's dynamically going to bring up your pods for you. So if you go to pods and say identity, Oh, I did it too slow. It's up already. So the reason why you see, the reason why you see two identities is because it, it, it'll, the first identity is going to wait around till your second identity is up and stable, and only then will it go away. So we even uh, account for failures in case your new one doesn't come up. So oh, there we go. Now it's terminating. You can see that the backup one is going down now, and uh, the first one is the new identity that came up. So if we go into this and go into what the YAML file looks like, you can see that it's at the older version that I modified it to. So I'm not lying. It actually did come up. And even better, if you go to the overview of what the pod looks like, you can see how much RAM it's using, how much CPU shares it's using, how much of the file system it's using. It gives you a bunch of information here. And you can even look at the logs in case um, something, it, this is basically just info messages. 
you don't see error anywhere. So this is basically where you can go to pick up your logs in case something goes wrong or if you just want to see if everything's OK. And this is where um, all your events are reported. And hmm, what else should I show you? OK, so let's go to the uh, cluster admin page. So this is the cool fact I was telling you about. We have the con container Linux update operator. So you can see that it already reports that it's up to date. Um, this is basically what's handling um, everything that you know your container Linux is up to date. And similarly, we have the Tectonic version operator, which is making sure that you are at the latest version of Tectonic. So as you can see, we're at our latest release, which we literally released yesterday. So it's hot and fresh out of the oven. And, and here we have our operators page. Because I chose to download our experimental operators, you can see that that's our etcd operator. And you can basically go into this and see what the definition looks like here as well. Again, you can dynamically update anything that you want. Um, let's see how our other cluster is doing. OK, it's at the very final step, so let's give it some more time. And in the meantime, maybe I can show you what it's like to play with the cluster from the kubectl point of view. Oh my god. OK, so um, before this, I already exported the kube config. Um, sorry, I can't make this bigger or everything won't fit in the screen. It's basically just going into my assets folder and taking the kube config from there. And I'm basically exporting it as an environment variable. So once that's done, once I do kubectl get pods in the tectonic system, that's the namespace we put all of our pods in. It's a little bit of latency because I deployed the cluster, cluster in Ohio and not in California. But um, you, usually, you shouldn't see that latency if it's um, somewhere close by. As you can see, this is, these are all the pods that we, oh. these are all the pods that we do deploy from Tectonic. You can see that we have um, two console pods, which is basically our dashboard. We run two just to keep it uh, replicated and scalable. We have our identity pod. We have our ingress controller, the Prometheus operator, everything that I basically told you about, the container Linux operator. So super intuitive, nothing too fancy here. You can go ahead, and now it's just like your Kubernetes cluster. Play around with it as much as you want with kubectl. And oh, it's always when you do a demo, it takes longer. I don't know why. but. In the meantime, I'll take some questions. Yeah. So the, uh, the question was if we publish the repo for the ingress controller. The ingress controller is something we take from upstream itself, which is in Kubernetes contrib folder. It's just under ingress, and it's the ingress controller. We, we basically digest that completely from upstream. We make a few modifications just to the config file, but that's just to like suit our environment. Any other questions? Yes? A pool of workers? Yeah. So if you, I'll go back to my deployments. Oh, sorry, it's under nodes. OK, uh, where is that page? It's basically around, like, you can basically see the master nodes and the worker nodes. I'm forgetting which. Can someone? Oh, did. Which one was it in? Do you remember which page it was in? The worker nodes and the. Oh, right, right. Yeah, OK. And, but I still don't see the. I remember seeing explicitly the worker nodes and the, anyway, but it's, it's around here somewhere. But yes, we do <laughs> use a pool. I'm sorry about that. 
If I poke around it some more, I don't work on the front end, so I'm not super familiar with this, but I, I promise it's around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, during the setup, it's going to ask you if you want to bring your own etcd to it, and it's not going to launch one for you. And it's basically then you can use your own one that you already have up. Can I use? Um, yeah, I think so. I don't think we have a requirement around that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes. I will make sure my slide deck is available. Um, OK, I'm going to ask some more questions and give away some more t-shirts while we get this to work. I basically tell you to launch the console. And yes, and we have it up. Yay. OK, that's all I have. So the question was if there's some disruption time in between when the container Linux operator will go ahead and update your um, OS version. Um, I would want to say about five to six minutes max. It's the same thing with even the tectonic channel operator. To basically update to your next version, it takes about five minutes. So, I mean, in that meantime, I mean, I guess the best we could do is five minutes, yes. So there is a disruption of about five minutes. The question was if we have any plans to make the use of persistent storage easier on the cluster. But we use etcd, which comes inbuilt with Kubernetes, so you don't really need to add anything else. Everything is already taken care of for you. You wouldn't need an external database. The question was, I meant that, I said that uh, Tectonic is scalable. What do I mean by that? So as you see, if you go into each of your deployments, let's go into, let's say the, let's go into the Tectonic identity, for example. If you go ahead and look at the number of replicas, I've set it to one right now. Sorry, it's small. Basically, all you can do is go ahead and add replica sets to your deployments or your pods. And all you have to say is, for this app, I want it to run like five replicas because I know it's important to my application for it to be highly available. So all you have to do is go ahead and increase the replica count here, and Tectonic will take care of how it deploys it, where it deploys it, which machines it needs to run on, and you don't have to worry about how you go and put that deployment on a machine itself. The question was if there are any plans to offer it on DigitalOcean. I would have to say not in the immediate roadmap, but uh, uh, Rob. Somebody, right? <laughs> you somebody should talk to Rob me. on the side. <laughs> the last thing I'm going to leave you with is we have our CoreOS Fest coming up, which is on May 31st and June 1st. We also announced that we have, I think, three scholarships to give out. So if you guys want like a fully paid free trip, uh, go ahead, and I urge you to apply. And OK, we already covered questions. So unless we have some more, I'll go around and deliver all those t-shirts now. OK, great. Thank you.